So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the National Museum of Natural History and to tonight's program, uh, jointly sponsored by the uh, NIH, us, and Johnson & Johnson. My name's Jonathan Coddington. I'm the Associate Director for Science here uh, at the Natural History Museum. And just to give you um, a little bit of context, uh, this institution, the National Museum of Natural History, actually dates from the founding of the Smithsonian, about 1846. So we're primarily a research institution like NIH. Uh, it's the largest natural history museum in the world and uh, also the most visited with about 8 million uh, visitors. This is actually the capstone event to our uh, genome exhibit, which uh, just closed last month and is now opening in San Diego. So about 3.8 million people saw that. And uh, the reason we're joined at the hip here is really because our, of our interest in informal science learning and getting the word out about the genomics revolution, both at the level of human health and for us, uh, the genome of the rest of the uh, animals on Earth. So um, that's what we do. And I'll turn the program over to Seema Kumar, who is from Johnson & Johnson, and uh, she'll do the rest of the introductions. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Seema Kumar. I am Vice President for Innovation, Global Health, and Public Policy Communications at Johnson & Johnson. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you all to this very special evening and to this closing ceremony of this wonderful exhibit that has been around here at this museum for about a year now, co-sponsored, actually put together by the NIH, the National Human Genome Research Institute, and um, the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Um, we, Johnson & Johnson, just a couple of words about Johnson & Johnson, we're a broadly based healthcare company that does a variety of different uh, types of uh, work that impacts the health of human beings all over the world. Uh, we are in pharmaceuticals, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as consumer healthcare. And uh, most people know us as a baby powder and band-aids company. Um, but we are actually much, much more than that. We are that, of course, but we're much more than that. We're a scientific powerhouse. We believe in the power of genomics to actually impact human health um, in a variety of different ways. And so it was really a pleasure to be a sponsor of um, this exhibit and also a sponsor of today's events. We had some really stimulating discussions uh, all the way uh, to public health priorities today that we face um, with uh, the outbreak of Ebola and how genomics is helping trace actually the, the origin of the outbreak. So it's been a wonderful uh, day, a wonderful evening, and we're looking forward to actually our, our next event. And I just want to say on behalf of Johnson & Johnson that um, we also believe in public education um, of science. We believe in inspiring and engaging uh, the public as well as the next generation of researchers and uh, young scientists into this field. And so it was an honor for us to actually um, be a sponsor of this. And with that, uh, I turn it over to Dr. Eric Green, who is the director of NHGRI. Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Seema. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, let me add my own welcome to all of you uh, uh, to this last uh, component of this uh, symposium that really is serving as a celebration of the 14-month run of Genome Unlocking Life's Code here at the museum. Uh, we bid it farewell last month and watched it find its way to San Diego, and several of us were at the opening of the exhibition um, as the first stop of a four- to five-year tour out in uh, San Diego uh, on Saturday evening. Um, this exhibition, this entire program, this entire collaboration really represents very productive partnerships be between a number of groups. It includes the National Institutes of Health, in particular the National Human Genome Research Institute, which I have the pleasure of serving as the director, the Smithsonian Institution, in particular the National Museum of Natural History. And three years ago, we got together without really knowing each other and I think have done a remarkable job in putting together not only an exhibition but a series of events and a series of public engagement activities 
uh, that are really, I think, very much helping um, you know, uh, the public understand genomics. And it also includes uh, the partners that we've developed in terms of donors. Things like this just don't happen unless we are able to convince the private sector such as Johnson & Johnson and other, as well as uh, a number of uh, private citizens who are willing to uh, help support such an endeavor. And working with our good friends at the Foundation for NIH who raised the money on our side of the equation to make this a reality. Uh, we've seen great things happen. Numbers of programs all year long while the exhibition was here, and this is the final in this series of programs. So needless to say, we're immensely proud at the, the accomplishments so far and the millions and millions of people that wandered through the exhibit and learned a lot about genomics and the number of uh, people that came and really saw it and said wonderful things about it. And, uh, and we had a great day today. We learned a little bit about some ideas around genomic medicine and applications of genomics to medical care, especially <laughs> looking towards the future, and thinking about some of the aspects of genomics as it pertains to global health. And then this final panel, which I'm about to turn you over to, um, really is also going to continue this conversation of what the public is thinking about genomics and how it really is touching people's lives. And it includes, and I'm not going to introduce the people, a, a member of our own institute um, in, in, in Barbiesikers. It also includes a very good friend of ours of the institute for many years, probably even decades, Dave Valley. But I want to give a special thanks, even before she's introduced formally, to Carolyn Hacks, who comes here at our invitation to, to, to share with us her thoughts and some of her stories. Um, and it was very, uh, very gracious of her to spend some time participating in this symposium. So I'm going to let the longer introduction uh, be given by the moderator of tonight's session, uh, Rebecca Roberts, who I now get to introduce. Um, and, and Rebecca is a program coordinator for Smithsonian Associates, another partner in these programs that we've been putting on where she produces public programs on subjects as varied as ice cream scoops, pirates, and particle physics, and now tonight, genomics. And for the past year, she and her colleagues at the Smithsonian Associates have been collaborating with our institute and also the National Museum of Natural History to create a whole series of these innovative programming all around and meant to complement uh, the genomics exhibition. But before joining the Smithsonian, she was an award-winning science and technology journalist. Um, and I'm just reading what my staff told me. She traveled the world to interview transgenic goats and hiking through Icelandic geysers in high heels. So I didn't make this up. It's what's here, and I'm simply conveying that to you. But here in Washington, her hometown, she just serves as a substitute host for public radio programs like Morning Edition, Talk of the Nation, and the Kojo Nandi Show. So I will turn this over to Rebecca. Also thank her for moderating this evening's session, and uh, she will introduce the other members of the panel a bit more formally. Thank you very much. It's uh, really great that you're here. Thank you all for having us here tonight. It is totally true about the goats <laughs> and about the high heels on the geyser. Um, before we go any further, let me just remind you, please silence your cell phones. You don't want to be that person. I was at a program recently where a guy's phone rang and his ringtone was the chicken dance. <laughs> so especially if you have something embarrassing like that going on, please turn them off now. Uh, let me introduce our panel starting from stage right. Dr. Barbara Biesecker is the director of the Johns Hopkins University National Human Genome Institute, Institute Genetic Counseling Program and adjunct associate professor in health, behavior, and society at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. As well, Dr. Biesecker is an associate investigator in the social and behavioral research branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute and head of the Genetic Services Unit. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have this evening. <laughs> 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 we get to Thank make so up our own titles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Biesecker, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, and in the middle here is Dr. David Valley. He is the Henry J. Knott Professor and Director of the McCusick Nathans Institute of Genetic Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's also a Professor of Pediatrics, Ophthalmology, and Molecular Biology and Genetics. Dr. Valley is also the Founding Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Inherited Disease Research. David Valley, welcome to the panel. And with a much easier title, Carolyn Hacks is a writer and columnist for the Washington Post and author of the advice column, Carolyn Hacks. The column debuted in 1997. It's now syndicated on more than 200 newspapers. Um, Carolyn Hacks once described her column as intended from the start to be the kind of advice you'd get from a friend if that friend were relatively stable and brutally honest and had possibly gotten up on the wrong side of the bed that year. Carolyn Hacks, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much for being here. So let me just say uh, that this panel grew out of 
the experience of having the exhibit up in this museum for 14 months, and I hope you all did have the chance to see it uh, before it went to San Diego. Just from a visitor experience viewpoint, I was really impressed with that exhibit because when you're doing a whole human genome exhibit, what do you show, right? It's like, well, let's have a model of the double helix and then, you know, I, I'm out, I'm done. <laughs> but that exhibit was incredibly smart about rooting genomic research in the human story. And so there was that great computer panel where you could sort of choose a hypothetical family who was facing a hypothetical dilemma and see what happened when they made their hypothetical choices. And that really brought some of these stories to life, but what kept happening was people were saying, yeah, but what about in my family? My experience is slightly different. What if this happened? And bringing their own family histories and their own priorities to the hypotheticals that were in the exhibit. So that's what tonight is about. Tonight is the chance to talk about what about my situation. And when you all reserve tonight, you were given the chance to submit questions. We have lots which we are eager to start with, but there are also going to be volunteers trolling the aisles, yes, with index cards. Um, and so if you have questions you would like added to the forum, we will get to as many of those as we can. Just write them down on an index card and one of the volunteers will bring them up on stage to us. So let's get started. This is a question that was submitted uh, by one of you. And uh, I'll just read the question and then we'll sort of get everyone's reaction to it. Discuss the difference between testing for a definitive result for untreatable diseases <coughs> such as Huntington's and the increased risk odds for treatable diseases such as breast cancer. So I think there's two parts here, the treatable, untreatable part, but also the definitive result versus increased risk. Barbara, you want to start that one? So when people come and talk to us about genetic risk or the option for genetic testing, um, they come usually based on their family history or something that's been brought to their attention that suggests that they're at increased risk. And when we think about common disease like cardiovascular risk or cancer risk, the testing that we can offer if it's indicated um, can help us um, estimate the likelihood that they might develop that cancer in the future and then talk about prevention and and treatment options that may be available to them. That's very different than the definitive test that is in the question about um, whether or not you carry a single mutation for a, a dis disorder like Huntington's, which if you live long enough will inevitably declare itself. Um, and so there's no living at risk. You either inherited the mutation or, or you didn't. So. That's one of a choice that's much more about personal values and beliefs, whether you want to know, whether it's useful to you to know whether or not you inherited a, a gene mutation you're at risk for. And one might argue that the risk estimate that you learn for cardiovascular risk or cancer risk is in many ways medical information because it can adjust your treatment and um, at least your screening activities that might result in early detection. And so those are very different kinds of pieces of information and we might be more likely to persuade people if they're at increased risk mm -hmm. to use testing if it's going to help with screening. Um, whereas in Huntington's we would all, I think most of us agree that that's a very personal choice and we would want to help people make a good decision for themselves. And Carolyn, in terms of the, the um, screening might make you change your life a little bit if you're at risk for something, but it also might be information you don't want. Um, it, it, it depends very much on your knowledge of yourself. And it's asking a lot of people to, to be able to say, okay, I can predict how I will react to this information. But I think people, I, I, I've, I've, over the years, I've, I've, there are two kinds of people. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are the people who, it's funny, when we, when we end up talking about infidelity of all things, and, and you know, I just saw somebody, I just witnessed something, do I tell? And there are, just over and over again in these situations, there are the people who are just absolutely rabid. Tell, they should know, they need that information. And there are some people like, oh gosh, don't go in and blow up their lives. That's the, that's the schism we're talking about here. You know, this camp gets tested, this camp should not. And the only, to me, the, the thing to identify is which, do you know which camp you're in? Are you confident in that? Can you, because, I, I just, I just think, and I think you have to know, be pretty confident in that before you make your decision. And David, I think that the added question here about the increased risk question, which 
sometimes you need to kind of know your statistics in order to understand right. what those tests actually mean. Right. Uh, well, I think um, one thing that's implicit in this question that I would just state is that um, as genetics and genomics expands, uh, we will see a genetic component in all disease. And so this scenario that we've laid out, uh, what do we, how do we counsel people who are at risk for a specific disorder in a very black and white uh, situation, either they have it or they don't, versus a group of people who um, may, because of certain genetic variants, be at increased risk, some modest increased risk, uh, that will be going on over and over again, not just when you go see your friendly geneticist, but as medicine advances, it will be part of going to see the doctor or even before you go to see the doctor. I think um, helping people understand risk, to get back to your specific question, is, um, is challenging because I think people um, incorporate into their understanding of risk not only the number, but also the burden of the question involved. And I think probably we have all had families where you say, um, you know, your recurrence risk is very small, let's say less than 1%. And they may say, I don't care how little, I don't care if it's one in a million, I, don't, I cannot bear to go through this again, let's say if it's a parent who've had a child. So uh, we all perceive risk differently. I think it's the duty of the geneticist or the physician to help people understand the risk as accurately and as, as uh, completely as possible. And then we also need to, um, in the case of being at risk, we need to give them uh, information, consistent information, clear information about what are their options of dealing with that risk, minimizing that risk, and uh, increasing their odds for staying in a state of good health. Let's put this in a specific instance because there is a question here. What is some advice you can share about deciding whether to and when to get tested for the BRCA1 or 2 gene and what to do with the resulting information? So staying with you, David, for a second. Um, first of all, where does that test fall on definitive answer versus increased risk? In the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I would also just parenthetically say one of the exciting things about being in uh, medicine and genetics at the current time is that our field is changing very, very rapidly. And so just in the last few years, I think we've seen uh, different ideas about how um, testing for breast cancer uh, has evolved. And so um, the sort of, I think, state of the art right now is to test those individuals who, by virtue of their family history, are, are, are perceived to be at somewhat higher risk. Uh, but we are now seeing other people begin to advocate uh, uh, because the test, our ability to interpret the test, and because we understand that our knowledge has increased, we're beginning to be at a situation where we can begin to uh, contemplate applying that test across the entire population at, let's say, age 30. Now, the answer, uh, whether if you have a variant that we can interpret as being one of high risk, it still isn't 100%, and there are things that one can do with that information uh, to, uh, uh, to bring your risk, uh, the, to avoid, let's say, the, the uh, serious consequences of that. So it's a very exciting time. Things are changing. Um, I, I must say that I personally am attracted to the idea, as we have learned more, to really contemplating moving this to a population-wide um, test. So it would be routine, like a mammogram. Right, and so that, um, because right now what we are doing is we're uh, identifying those families, those individuals that are at risk by picking those people whose relatives have had cancer. And we should get to a stage where we don't, ha that's not, not the entry point. The entry point is we have this test, we know what it means, we can um, give, give you information about that and we know what to do about it. So I guess in part, one of the things you would wanna know when you're making this decision is, you're talking about the percentage of calculating risk, but you also wanna know the percentage of the effectiveness of the measures you take to prevent. Absolutely. I mean, and so that seems to be, 
I mean, that to me is more of an X factor even than the likelihood of, the, of, of getting the illnesses. Okay, because I can't do anything about, I want to know what I can control. And if you can give me something high percentage to control, I'm going to be much more motiva motivated mm -hmm. to get tested, mm -hmm. even if I've got no family history. Well, there's a, there's a good contrast in BRCA1 and 2 testing. So these are two very common mutations for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And the screening is much better for breast cancer than it is for ovarian cancer. So we can still screen for ovarian cancer, and there's certainly surgeries that can be used to prevent or minimize the chance of getting ovarian cancer. But people feel differently even about the things that you can do about both of those two cancers in this, that, that are coincide with the same gene mutation. Mm -hmm. Well, this, um, if we're talking about, say, that that test becoming something that you do after age, whatever, and it's a common test re regardless of family history. That leads into a more general question, which also comes from the audience, how much testing should one get if there's no family history of genetic disease? I mean, if our genetic information is getting better and better, and if it's just like doing a, you know, throat culture for strep, how much should you, how much information do you actually want to know? Well, it sort of goes back to Carolyn's point earlier, which is we're all very different in what information we want to know. And for people who go to their physicians, if the physicians are familiar with new genetic testing, um, maybe the onset of genome sequencing, they may have strong opinions about whether people with no history should avail themselves of these new tests where they can learn potentially of variants and mutations that we understand pretty well, but we wouldn't know to look for because there was no family history. We don't really have a um, an immediate precedent for that. I um, think there'd have to be a lot of thought put into who would be available to counsel the people who find out they're at increased risk. These are not people who grew up in a family thinking that this is going to happen to them, and some of the risk can be fairly startling. If you look at the hereditary cardiovascular disease mutations where people are at increased risk for sudden death, uh, that's a pretty dramatic piece of information to take on. But, but think about it. We don't have counselors helping us process our mortality. I mean, we're all, we're all looking yep. at this one, and we've all had to process yep. certain death. And so what you're talking really is about putting a finer point on it. And so, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's how fine is this point going to be? At the moment, it's, it's varied. You know, for some illnesses, mm -hmm. it's a very fine point. We mm -hmm. can give you certainty. And with some of them, it's we can give you percentages. And again, you know, if you're going to make me eat more broccoli, I want to know it's going to do something. <laughs> you know, and so again, it will. It these will. Are, these are all fine shadings of processing what what yep. could happen, and, and it's really. I mean, to me, it's how do you live with the weight of knowledge, and how good is your how good is your prevention information for me? Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful because what you're doing is predicting the future. I'm sort of talking about you know moving into that, and that's going to be sort of a graduation of now mm -hmm. this being a sort of public consumer endeavor where you go to your physician, and this is part of medical care, and we get used to getting this information, and it's routine, and we don't specialize, and we don't see a counselor about it. I think you're predicting exactly what's going to mm -hmm. happen. I'd like to see us transition. Um, to get there because I think it's a little, it's shifting the paradigm quite a lot and it takes people a while to kind of get used to that, but especially you, you've in got a, it. And we're in a land of death hysteria. I mean, right, Americans don't do death very well. I mean, we just, we don't talk about it well, we don't process it well, we certainly don't plan for it well and medicate it well. So maybe it's gonna, maybe that future is coming in other societies and mm -hmm. maybe we can peer in and say, that makes sense. Well, I, I would come back to the uh, point that uh, the field is changing, or medicine is changing very, very rapidly. And so what appears hopeless today may be, may be more manageable five years from now, let's say, or 10 years from now, uh, or it may not. Um, so it's, um, I think what is gonna be state of the art today will not be state of the art practice uh, a few years from now. And I think, we're seeing that, that sort of transition in the breast cancer, uh, breast and ovarian cancer area right now, but there, of course, remain other disorders for which we're really uh, not able to budge the, the needle at all. And are you seeing a similar change, Barbara, in um, audience sophistication around these issues? 
issues? I mean, if you're talking about sort of weaning people off of counseling around these results, have you watched people get more knowledgeable and have a baseline? Oh, certainly. I mean, there's huge differences now in what the, all the information people have access to on the internet, and we live in a very privileged part of the United States, so people have a lot of access to information and come with very intelligent questions and <laughs> taking control over the choices that they may face based on their family history is definitely I wouldn't say it's universal. <laughs> but we certainly see that in the clinic as well, that the people come in, some are extremely well informed, uh, others are, have worked hard at it, but still are, have misinformation, and others are still pretty much, they want to hear um, from the healthcare professional what, what to do. I can't count on Google. Pardon? <laughs> I can't count on Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can look. <laughs> Uh, along the veins of sort of um, increased public awareness, um, of course, there's been the ice bucket, bucket challenge has you know, flooded Facebook lately. This question is, with the overwhelming awareness of ALS, actually, before I ask this question, let me ask you, Carolyn, what was your reaction to the ice bucket challenge as someone who lived through watching your mom? It was, it was so, first of all, it was delightful. Um, I mean, I, I also saw the origin story, which was so not delightful seeing this young person afflicted was horrible. Um, but it's, it's hard to describe the experience of being in a community where you're watching something terrible happen and there's nothing you can do about it. You're completely powerless. And you know that the research has made progress, but we're still far from being, I mean, there's really no treatment even. It's just, it's just a death sentence and they send you home and they try to keep you comfortable. And the families, um, the, the, the patients are traumatized, the families are traumatized, and at the same time, we're a very small community, so we, we just can't make enough noise to make a difference. And so this has been going just year after year after year. We walk, we, we cajole, we beg, and we just make almost no dent. And to see this thing just sort of come out of nowhere and to see this, this millions just showering on your cause, I mean, it was just, my sister, we, we have a family reunion on Cape Cod every year, and my older sister was sitting on her computer just playing the videos. And she said, she said, I can't, I, I can't wrap my mind around this. I can't stop watching these. And she was, you know, she was choked up. And so it was just, I just wanted to go around saying thank you. Like, thank you, everybody. And of course, that lasted about two weeks. And then all the naysayers came in. But I was just, you know, thank you for, thank you too, because it kept it going even longer. Um, but it's, as I said, it was just a, it was just a, it was a mind blowing experience to take our our little bit of hell and to see just all this light and love coming to it was unbelievable. The question specifically, and David, I think you're the best person to start with this, is how do you think that changed the desire for more scientists to apply more clinical or translational research? Uh, well, it certainly, I think, raised the awareness in the research community. And uh, there is one of the paradoxes that we live with right now is that uh, research funding from NIH and, and the sources that we typically got research funded by in the past are having to, to tight, tighten their belts. And so people are looking for other sources of funding. And so to see people so, um, involved in this and so enthusiastic about getting people involved in the research was, was very rewarding. And I'm sure people came into, will come into the field and maybe somebody will come in with a really good, good idea and good result. Uh, this question, I'll just read it. What are some current disparities in genetic research? Are advances being made more quickly within a certain subset of the human population due to the population surveyed, specifically in terms of certain ethnic and cultural groups? Hard question. Um, we certainly grapple with this a lot at NIH when we do studies, when we put out outreach to, um, to groups in the area and put advertisements in the Washington Post the people who respond are largely well-educated, have resources, and are more often Caucasian um, in responding. And so when we try to target specific populations of African Americans or Hispanics, we have to go out and into the community and do a much more involved, targeted job to recruit people 
to our studies. Obviously, in rare disease and the patient populations that come into NIH, rare disease does not discriminate, and so we see much more diverse populations come into the clinical center and partake of, of research. But it does take some sophistication or your physician being sophisticated to find out about studies at NIH and to make your way there. Um, and so all of us grapple with this on a day-to-day -day basis in the way we provide care and who has access to it, in the way we do research and who answers our research surveys. Um, and we, need, we have a, a long way to go. And I think the thing that worries us probably more than anything is just the overall disparities in how medical care is delivered in this country, and people who don't have insurance don't receive the same care as people who do. Um, well, uh, here's an insurance question. Uh, shouldn't insurance <laughs> company, uh, which is, anyway, shouldn't insurance companies pay for IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis services for women who are carriers of fatal X-linked disorders? They pay for IVF for infertile women, so now why not carriers of X-linked diseases? Um, well, I, I agree with the questioner. Me too. Uh, <laughs> I'm, is, there, I'm is there an insurance company underwriting any of yeah. this? <laughs> I think we have consensus. I mean, this is a, let me expand the question a little bit. Um, um, although we are being able to do, we are currently able to do more and more sophisticated genetic testing, uh, which yields precise and unambiguous, in many instances, uh, yields precise and unambiguous diagnosis that allows us to counsel families and to treat patients in a much more informed way, uh, getting those tests paid for uh, is still a challenge. And people in the clinic, I mean, in, in a typical working genetics clinic, part, a, a substantial part of the time is spent trying to get reimbursement for those tests. And even though, and I'm, I'm uh, way out of my depth here, I'm not an economist, but even though it seems to me that one can argue that over the long run, if you invest up front and get good information in the long run, it will um, uh, reduce the cost of, let's say, insuring a particular patient or a particular family. Uh, those arguments are still, we're still having to rehash those arguments day after day after day. And uh, it would be, in my view, a great move forward if we could get over this and do the testing uh, that is medically indicated and uh, not have trained people spending time trying to figure out whether the test is going to be reimbursed or not. Um, so now that you all are warmed up, I'm going to throw out uh, what I think is a very tough question, which is, if you are predisposed to certain quality of life altering conditions, would it be irresponsible to have children? It, it depends. I mean, if, do, you, do you have the condition yourself, or are you a carrier? So if you have it yourself, you're in a, you're in a strong position to decide if that is a life. If you look at your own life as worth living, given your health situation, then I don't think it's irresponsible to have children. But if you if you yourself don't have it, then you have to think, then you have to project that question. Is this a life that I would want to live? Is this the life that people who have this condition want to live? I mean, again, you're, you're trying to decide the value of life. And I think any parent is doing that. I mean, you're, when you decide to have children, you're, you are sort of, you're conferring that, I don't know, you're, you're playing God in a way. You're deciding whether this, you can be, you can provide a good life. And I just think that that's, it's the same question, it's just, more complicated and more fraught, and probably one you don't want to talk about in public because you can have, you can have people take great exception to the way you look at it. I think that's a really important point is the, the personal part of that is to help people make really good choices for themselves, but the, the what's hard about that question is that it implies that maybe we have a responsibility to society not to bring people who are affected into this world. And I think we don't have a lot of good open conversations about that. Um, in the United States, we really 
Um, we really value our autonomy and our ability to make decisions for ourselves in very much the way that Carolyn very nicely illustrated um, how we do it. And we don't talk outside of our, our own personal bubble much about um, what we're doing. And I think this is going to be something that we continue to need to talk about as a society on a large basis. Um, I can't imagine imposing restrictions on people's childbearing decision. This just seems to me the most personal and ultimate issue of controlling others. But um, I certainly do think um, redistribution of resources and other social goods are something that I hope we get closer to in medicine as a whole. Maybe not, maybe preserving the privacy of the childbearing decisions. I don't know. It's a hard question. I think it's a, I agree, uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, and it's a, and it can be approached at different levels. You can approach it at a societal level and think about resources and so forth. Then you can approach it at the individual level um, and um, uh, how, how people see their, the worth of their own lives. And of course it's possible, I would think, to view that you, your own life has a real worth and you've made lots of contributions. Um, but you also decide that I'd rather not have my child have to deal with this. Um, I'd rather have them live life without having this problem. And um, so from the point of view of a geneticist in the clinic, I think our job is to um, inform people as clearly and as, as accurately as we can so that they make those kinds of really um, major decisions with a complete, you know, with a state of the art uh, sort of knowledge set. And, um, and very often that means going th over things more than one time and putting it in different terms, even having different people uh, pitch it so that um, the people who have to make the decision, that is the parents or, the, or whatever, uh, make it with the state of the art information. Mm -hmm. And there's one, there's one angle I don't think we talked about, which is also the the parents, I mean, we're talking about the ability to project and also society to absorb, but there's also, is, are you as a parent ready to take on mm -hmm. being the parent of somebody who might have these enormous needs? And of course, we're talking about all this and, and trying to calculate these decisions, and then of course you can decide, no, I won't do it, I will adopt, for example, get outside my gene pool, and then you can take on something that's you can end up with something even more complicated than the thing you were trying to avoid. So it's, a, it's amazing. You really, I mean, no matter how, we could, we could talk this down to, a, to a, some sort of consensus. I'll just float that hypothetically because it's impossible. But even then, you're still, there's still this leap that you just don't know. It occurs to me too, we've done a couple of studies over the years in, um, of individuals affected with several different kinds of um, chronic genetic conditions and then their first degree relatives or their parents perspective and parents and siblings rate the quality of life of their affected family member differently than the person who is affected themselves so even the people who live with it intimately and at first we always thought that the early study trends were what we were going to see which is that people who are affected with the disease had higher ratings of their quality of life than their parents because their parents are also very concerned and feel responsible for their kids but it didn't it didn't pan out that way in various conditions we found various different ratings and it became more upsetting when we saw people who were affected rating their quality of life as lower than the people who love them and are close to them. And so there's a lot of things we don't understand about what goes into how we make those assessments, but they're really important for us to understand just the way that you've illustrated. And let me remind you all, there are people trolling the aisles with index cards. If you have questions you would like to submit, wave a hand. Um, in terms of handling some of these issues that come up, in what ways can a support group be good or bad for someone who has a high risk factor or family member with the disease? Carolyn, let's start with you on that one. Oh, I think it's, you may have a high risk health issue, but it's a pretty low risk venture to try out a support group. Um, often they're free and they are filled with people who probably have more experience just because you're seeking now. Generally the people there have a base of knowledge about what you're dealing with. And so even if you're unhappy with it, you can talk to the 
you know, the leader of it and get other information to go somewhere else. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, what's the worst that can happen? You know, you can, you can have an accident on the way to the support group. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, but that's, but I, I come to it with a, with a bias toward try the therapeutic approach, and if it doesn't work, I don't think you've lost anything. I mean, some people might run out of there feeling like their hair is on fire, but that's not my experience personally, so. I yeah, so we, we deal with this um, daily in genetic counseling, and I, I completely concur with Carolyn. I think there's not, there isn't a group for everyone, and sometimes you go and it, it doesn't feel like people are talking about the issues that are foremost in your mind or of concern, or you somehow don't relate to the group. There are other groups. There are now online ways to reach out to people who are otherwise isolated, who might write blogs, who might just make themselves available to have conversations with, and you don't even have the messiness of having to meet people personally, but you can share what you've learned about the condition or what you've learned in terms of coping. I just think the internet has, has just opened this up so widely. We, we definitely do not see people <coughs> feeling as isolated, even if they're physically isolated, geographically isolated, as we used to on a, on a routine basis in the early days of providing genetic services. I think it's tremendous. And I mean, it's funny, I lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan once where they had three support groups for Down syndrome. <laughs> and that was because they all had very different goals and directions, and one was for newborn parents, and one was for sort of school-age parents, and one was for adult parents, because they were all dealing with very different things, and they didn't like each other's groups. <laughs> but it worked really well, because when your kid got older, you went to the next one. I think that, I think there's a lot to be learned from the, from the support groups, and uh, very often, uh, uh, parents will say, well, you, you told us this, that, and the other, but what was really, really bothering me was how to cook the Pop-Tart the right way or some, some little practical thing that, a, that people in the clinic don't, doesn't come on our radar screen, and it turns out to be very useful information for the family. And so um, I think that, ki that kind of information is very useful. On the other hand, some people, um, you know, don't... Um, they find that they don't want to engage in support groups. They, they, they manage things in a different way. So I always try to tell people that these opportunities are out there, and increasingly they already know about it because of the Internet. Uh, but I also make it clear, like, you're not a bad person if you don't go join every support group uh, uh, for these things. So it works for some people and not for others. And from the general to the specific, this question is, how do I help my mother who's dealing with her mother, my grandmother, having dementia? It's heartbreaking all around, and I don't live close enough to help. I've recommended that she, my mother, get therapy for herself to no avail. Well, as I say, that's a great argument for a support group. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't want to get therapy. It feels like a... It feels like it has a high barrier to entry, although I would argue it doesn't. But I think to a lot of people it feels insurmountable, where the support group barrier to entry is quite low. And so somebody from afar can do the research and say, here, I've lined up respite care for you through this support organization, and you know, you're going to, this is where you would go for this meeting. And obviously you, you can only point out where the water is to the horse, but it's something. Um, we're getting some really terrific questions in here. Uh, this one I really love. Can we open this up to the possibilities? What are the things you see 20 years from now that are awesome? <laughs> <laughs> David, you want to start with that? <laughs> Hovercraft. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Pax. Boy, I think, uh, uh, I mean, in case you can't tell, I'm extremely enthusiastic about uh, what genetics is going to do for medicine. And um, so I think the sky is the limit for 20 years. I, it's, I, I wouldn't put any uh, uh, limits on it. And I think there will be uh, discoveries that uh, we, we can't anticipate right now. Uh, and there are certainly things uh, that we can do. There are things we can do in the lab right now that two years ago we barely even thought of, this uh, genetic or genomic uh, engineering where we can create 
uh, much more accurate models of disease to study in the laboratory is uh, something that's coming on like a tremendous uh, wave and has great opportunities. Um, so um, there's that sort of eureka uh, results that will come along. Um, there will also be sort of the slow, steady progress um, that is just uh, going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of thought. And, um, and it's also going to take, um, at some, I think, you know, we're, some of these problems, some of the things we've discussed today are things like that they sound like there's some potential pitfalls. And so one response to that is to say, I can't, I'm not going to do anything because I'm afraid of the pitfalls. And another response to it is to say, okay, I'm going to learn as much as I can about this, and then I'm going to take my best shot at it. And I may make some mistakes along the way. I may have to self, may have to correct course periodically. But I think we have to be willing to do that kind of slow, steady uh, progress and then also uh, embrace and, and um, the sort of eureka things that come along. Uh, Carolyn, this question is for you. What has been the most difficult health question you've answered in your column? <laughs> Mm. Can we go back? Can I think if we go yes. back to that? Because that's we absolutely can get back. Let me give Barb a chance time. to answer the previous question about yeah, things coming I up that are awesome. About the excitement. I think um, you know you can't be in genetics today, or if you are and you're not excited, that's really sad. You should get another job um, because things are. <laughs> there's no more stimulating, you know, scientific career to be in right now because things are. I train graduate students and. The curriculum we're teaching them this year doesn't resemble the one that we taught them last year. And what they're seeing in the clinic and the choices that people are being offered are more extensive and, and differ in, um, in how you frame the choices for people. So um, in 20 years, the thing that I, um, I look forward to is the number of clinical trials that have just started up in rare diseases that I never thought that I would live to see is tremendous. They're early phase trials and there's lots of bumps along the way. But that's very, very exciting that things that I didn't think I'd ever see is potentially treatable maybe in 20 years. That's a lot of time to learn a lot uh, about, um, about treatment for things that we wouldn't have even had a dream about treating. So that's very exciting. And the other thing I think we'll see is a movement from um, sort of Mendelian genetics, one gene mutation for one disease uh, or disease risk to um, this sort of cascade of multiple gene effects and hopefully um, some input from understanding environmental insults that work together with the genes to cause people to tip over the threshold to have common disease, and diabetes and cancer generally and heart disease. That's really complicated. It's hard to even think about how we're going to do that now, but that's the direction things are going. That's, it's very, very exciting. So an another thing that I, I should have mentioned is that um, I agree 100% with what Barb said, and, but it's worth just pointing out, and I recently was asked to take stock, how many genes are there in our genome that when they have a particular variant can cause a disease or a clinical problem? And it turns out the number that we currently know is still quite small, a small fraction of the total. And I think that we will see over the next few years, because I think the, t the methods and the technology are now available, and uh, so I think this is a sort of you can bet on it kind of progress, that we will, in the relatively short time, certainly within 20 years' time, be able to um, enumerate the contribution of every gene in our genome to uh, human health. And um, that knowledge, which will be based in part on, or in large part, on the study of rare diseases involving those specific genes, but also basic science and also large population studies, will really bring a wealth of new knowledge into medicine and, I think, improve medicine and um, uh, make it a much more effective business. So in 20 years, the symposium will be on overpopulation. <laughs> in, in 20 years, it'll be on pre much more on prevention, I think, I hope. If, we, if we're not, if we, it'll be on prevention and treatment. It'll be on elder care. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it won't be by us. <laughs> it won't be by me. <laughs> no. All right, you ready? You come up yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm thinking of, of my questions that have 
a, a medical element to them. And of course, when it comes to me, it's always an emotional question. I mean, it's always an emotional problem. And of course, the, the, I think one of the, I didn't even answer it. I didn't answer it in print because I didn't have an answer. But it was, it was a, a story of what serious illness can do to people. It was a story of what our methods for dealing with serious illness can do to people, like our, basically our health system and the expenses. Basically, it was, a, it was a single mom and a daughter, grown daughter. The mom was ill and needed constant care. And so the daughter was, and they didn't have money, and so the daughter was working full time to support both of them and also taking care of her mom full time. And she was writing to me just saying, I see no hope. Like, I have no hope, I have no vacation, I have no savings, I have no life, I have no friends. And it just, and I'm, I'm just looking at this, I'm like, I have no answer. And I, you know, it's just, I would say that is the hardest question I got on a topic of serious illness, because I believe her. I believe that this is, you know, obviously we, we're, we're talking about things like support groups and networks and online, and, and sure, I'm, I'm sure that whatever the mother had, um, had a community around it that provided maybe respite care or something like that. But again, these are, these are things that are available. Somebody who's ill has doctors and doctors have access. And so apparently those remedies had not been enough. And sometimes you're just stuck. You're stuck for the, basically the duration of this person's life. And, I, and at least that's what I was reading. And it, was, it, was, it stayed with me. I probably got that six years ago. Um, Woody Guthrie and Lou Gehrig lived good lives in spite of ALS. Mozart died in his 30s. Are we setting unreasonably high expectations for life? <laughs> Look at you all waiting for someone else to answer that question thinking, first. You know, <laughs> thinking. Well, yes, I, I, but I, I just, I think you have to look at the, again, Life involves suffering, and I think we all have different thresholds, but I think there are some basic thresholds for the amount of suffering we're willing to tolerate. And, and I think that's what most of this is about. It's like, okay, how can, how can we minimize suffering? We can't eliminate it, and if you're asking to eliminate it, then you are being really unrealistic. And in fact, you're denying yourself one of the great pleasures of life, which is seeing the comparison between your suffering and when you're not suffering. And how can you enjoy this if you haven't had that? So I, I, I don't know, I, I, my, my Puritan roots are showing, but, um, <laughs> but I, I do think that we will witness at times a level of suffering that, that appears excessive. And again, this is totally subjective and it's, it's, it's based on your, the society you grow up in. I mean, I'm sure that our, our definition of unacceptable suffering is so much softer than one 200 years ago. And you know you keep going back and, and you just think of the amount of human suffering that led us to an industrialized society with, with medicine and, and science in such a prominent role. Um, you know, we, we're at a time where diseases aren't wiping out a, a third of Europe. So, you know, I, I think we're realistic based on what we see around us and, and we freak out accordingly. Yeah, I don't think the objective here, at least I would hope not, is to somehow normalize the population. I don't even know what that means um, or how we would do it. But difference is important in so many ways and teaches us so many things about, about ourselves. But most, many people with differences, and there's a wide variety of them, don't feel that they suffer. And many people with diseases that we consider as providers is pretty tough people live with with very high quality of life. And when you interview them, they often wouldn't change much about their life for exactly what you're saying is what they learn about suffering. But there are plenty of things that we see in the genetics clinic where people suffer in ways that are, keep us awake at night, like your inquiry do, that are just unimaginable. And if we have a way to, I mean, all you have to do is spend any amount of time in a pediatric genetics clinic. There are very sick children and children who die young, and I don't think anybody wants to ever see that happen if that's preventable. So, I mean, there are lines at which I think we can all as a society agree that we would like to do good 
um, with the things that we learn to exchange. David? I agree with those points. I mean, I, I think that um, the people that were mentioned certainly did uh, have productive lives, and, and I'm sure if they were here, they would say that they enjoyed their lives, whether they would choose to end, to have the end point of their life, the one that they were dealt with, um, is a different question, I think. And um, uh, um, I guess um, I, I have the, I perhaps a, I have a luxury of being trained in pediatrics. There's, as Barb mentioned, there's just no question what our goal is, which is to uh, improve the quality of life of those patients. Do Dr. Biesecker or Ms. Hacks have some pertinent anecdotes relating to advising disclosing genetic information to family members? <laughs> <laughs> That's Don't. One of, Don't. That's one of the. <laughs> unless that's one you're of the, invited to, I mean. Yeah, I, it's one of the most common questions we get in genetic counseling sessions, I think, um, and it's one of my favorite because um, people will often ask for advice, and I ask them what they've been thinking and how they might do it. And about half an hour later, they have this whole plan of what they're going to do, and I haven't said anything. And then they jump up and they <laughs> hug me and thank me <laughs> for my expertise. And the truth is that they know what they're going to do. Um, it's a hard thing to do, and it helps to have somebody to rehearse it with. But most people have spent years thinking about how they're going to divulge something in their family to a sibling or a child. And um, you know, you can help them sort of work through you know, what the downsides are and what's holding them back and whether they, this is the right time and why and what the setting might be, but people do a very good job taking care of themselves and none of the rest of us know enough about their families to be able really to give them direct advice about that, but we can coach them to take good care of themselves. Carolyn, why was your initial reaction, don't? Well, I, I, as I said, don't without an invitation. I, I just think it's, I, I, again, a, a real source of friction in families and people who are close uh, is when you cross that line between your certainty that you needed to know and you project it as other, another person's certainty that that person needs to know. And I think that you have to be really, really careful about how you use that information, how you, and again, you have that conversation. You, you have to know not just what you would want, but you have to understand your family member, you have to understand, you know, if, Two kinds of people, which one? Which one is this? And, and you also have to have a conversation to, to feel out the appropriateness of the conversation. Now, obviously, if you have a child and you have something in your family, then you're going to have to tell that child at some point, especially if, again, you have, there are preventive measures you can take or, or things you can do to preserve your health, or if they need to know that they need to travel early and, and often. But, you know, it's, um, but with a peer, I think you have to be very careful not to over-inform just because you wanted to know. It's very hard in families where there are estranged family members or people who don't have much of a relationship and there's a risk identified for something like hereditary cancer that people could be screened for. Um, it's, it's understandable that they wouldn't want to contact people out of the blue and say, oh, by the way, you're, you may be at risk for this cancer. Very difficult thing to do. Um, but in many cases, people often come to the decision that that's the right thing to do, so that people are armed with information that they can make their own personal choices about. Um, but that's not easy easy to do. It's, um, I, I would say it's surprising how different people view these issues differently. And part of that difference uh, perhaps stems from lack of understanding. But then once you've sort of done your very best to uh, bring their state of understanding to as an accurate level as possible. They still have different views on what it means, what they should do, and, and so it's very highly individual and it also changes over time. A person may have, one, have a particular opinion at one point of time and then with the passage of time uh, they, have, you know, they see it in a different light. So it's, it's, um, 
I think it's one, one of the uh, real fascinating parts about doing this kind of work as to how, how different people perceive it. That's a good point, too, about the, that you might change, because I can think of, um, you put yourself in this situation, you say, okay, would I want to know about the possi possibility of this illness? At 22, I would probably say, no, I don't want to know. Let me, let me have this time. Mm -hmm. And then now, as I'm pushing 50, now I'd want to know, because there are certain things I'm going to want to get done. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, mm -hmm. and so that's very apt. You have to think about the state of the people that you're talking to as well. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, this is from an audience member who says, I was a docent on the exhibit. My experience, the vast majority of visitors said they did not want to do testing. Of the docent group, well over half did not want to know. Mm -hmm. So that also might be a function of age. I just think that's a fascinating issue. When you get a room full of geneticists, that's a that's a fun, right. fun conversation. <laughs> and and wow, I have invite to say me to your that, next party. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I will. I think you, <laughs> you know, despite the fact that I work on a, a, a genome sequencing study at the NIH where people are wildly enthusiastic to, um, if I can grossly generalize, to learn their results. Um, for a variety of different reasons. I don't have any interest in knowing my own genome sequence. I never have. It hasn't veered. It hasn't changed. And it doesn't bother me that I do, and it doesn't bother me that other people want to know. Um, I think you can be excited and interested in genomics and not necessarily want to know everything. David, you want Is to that on tape? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, you're I, on. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, um, I haven't, I certainly haven't done any of my own genetic yeah. testing, but I'm also, you know, uh, um, it would be a curio for me now at this stage of my life. It would be relevant perhaps to my kids, but I wouldn't do it without, um, you know, discussion with them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting point. We're talking about as a, as a fait accompli, when you know in something, how do you say it? But, but you can make an argument that even the decision to get tested is something that you have to think about in the context of, every, of the yep. rest of your family. Yep. I mean, because you might say, well, I'm curious, but then all of a sudden you're freighted with this knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you should almost ask whether they would want it, they would want you to know. I, I will say this, I think uh, one's uh, decisions will be different uh, if it's sort of like a, um, just like, well, would you, would you want to have your genome sequenced for curiosity's sake, let's say. That's one, that's one level. But if you're at risk or you're right. somebody in your yes. family is at risk for a particular problem, a then you, you know, it's hard to really, I think it's a different issue and what you think in a sort of nonspecific general way may be very different from what you uh, decide when you're under the gun, basically. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Um, for geneticists, genetic information is comprehensible. For many lay people, the results of a genetic test may be confusing, even frightening. As genetic tests become more common, do you see the job of genetic counselor becoming more popular? Or should doctors be trained to perform the task of explaining the complicated results of a genetic test? <laughs> Barbara? Both. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. All of the above. All of the yeah, above. This is going to move out into mainstream medicine. It's already starting to. So we got to get our primary care docs more comfortable with genetics. And the studies, even that have been funded by our institute, have shown that primary care docs don't know a lot about genetics. But um, I think we have to continue to try and help them. Um, and, and the geneticists and genetic counselors will help with that transition. It's going to be a mess for a while because there will be things that are hard to, hard for the local docs to, um, to interpret. Um, the genetic counselors are starting to think about workforce issues and different ways to train genetic counselors because we almost certainly will need more of them. They may end up not looking exactly the same as they have for the, the past 35, 40 years um, because we have very small programs. We do very hands-on training. They're in the clinic at least a day a week. Um, all through their graduate education, and it, that makes it very time intensive. And so um, if we added a lot of students, it would put on most of the programs an undue burden for them to get clinical experience. So we're starting to think about 
Are there different ways to share what genetic counselors do and train people in different ways? And it'll take some time to figure that out, but we're, we're starting to look into it. It's been a fantastic career um, over the course of, of my career because things, <laughs> what, what we started with was pretty simple. Um, we couldn't diagnose most of the people that we saw. But when we could, it was a single gene mutation. Um, and it's gotten far more complicated, so it's been stimulating and a, a way to sort of relearn as you go along. You have to relearn your genetics the entire time. It's been a very fun profession, so I think it's a great thing for people to go into, but I don't think it can stay the same. In, in terms of training doctors, are there specialties that are better at it than others? I mean, I think I about pediatricians, the right? That, like they, yeah. they think about these things. Oh, oh don't, yeah. think, don't get me started. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm getting you started. I, I'd like to weigh in on that <laughs> um, in a general way. Um, the, um, I think that um, everyone who practices, first of all, genetics underlies all of medicine. So whether you're a plastic surgeon or an internist or an obstetrician or a psychiatrist or whatever you are, as we go forward, you're going to need to understand, if you... If your goal is to understand your patients, then you're going to need to understand genetics much more than uh, days gone by. So uh, uh, I think of genetics as something that should be uh, inculcated into the fiber of all physicians. Now, that's going to take a while. Uh, however, genetic counselors are fantastic. Um, they, um, the reason being, is that they have been, they have training, uh, they understand the genetics, but they also have training in areas about understanding people and how people make decisions and how people understand uh, information and good news and bad news and so forth and so on. So at least at this stage of medicine, um, boy, we need a lot more genetic counselors, I think. And uh, it also what I observe at our place is that um, increasingly, we are contacted, we, the Institute of Genetic Medicine, are contacted to ask, do we have a counselor that could come and work, uh, let's say, a half a day a month in Clinic X? Because there's a few patients there that might need some genetic counseling. And so we always try to take advantage of that. And what happens invariably, 100% of the time, is, first of all, the patients get better information. That's number one. Number two, while the counselors are sitting in the room waiting for the next patient, they educate the doctors. And so it's a really potent educational um, activity. And uh, usually two or three months down the road, then they come back and they say, we'd like that. Could we increase that clinic, that counselor in the clinic um, a day a, a month? And then it's a day a week and that sort of thing. And so we... Um, as Barb indicated, the, the, the number of counselors that are currently being trained, I think, are going to very shortly be or currently inadequate for the job at hand. This next year is going to be the first year. There's certainly going to be more jobs than counselors trained. Now, it comes, comes with challenges. You have to get reimbursement and, and, and all of those little mundane details about how to pay for them. But um, I think they're cre incredibly valuable. Well, while we're on the subject, um, how would you recommend young students get involved in this area, and what type of person makes a good genetic counselor? Somebody who loves the, the science of genetics and how it works, explaining it to other people, and helping them uh, make meaning out of it, and incorporating it into their lives. So it's a great combination of you know, appreciation for a sort of basic science, um, but what you care most about is how people process it and use it and apply it in their lives. So most of our graduate students who come into our program have strong background in molecular biology or genetics and also psychology. Um, and we spend a lot of time, I believe that actually it's harder to learn the counseling skills than it is the genetics if you already have a good strong science background. Mm -hmm. Very hard to learn how to work with people and predict um, what they're going to need when they're making difficult decisions and li live with difficult consequences. I li just last week, um, a student who's at the beginning of his, his, we have some boys in genetic counseling, although it's primarily <laughs> women, um, of his second year, he was presenting a case he saw over the summer 
where a father completely identified with him because he, well, he was assuming because he was the other male in the room, and he had come in to find out if he was a BRCA2 carrier because his mother was. He was at 50% risk, and he didn't want to be there. He hated physicians. He never wanted to go to the clinic. He was there because his wife told him he had to, and he was learning about the chances that this could be passed on to his children, and he just started to sob, belly sob, sob and sob and sob. And he turns to this student, who's not really in charge of the case, um, and said, if I had known this, I never, ever would have had the, these children to begin with. And um, part of the student's um, reason for bringing up the case was how to take care of somebody who is regretting such a major life decision. And part of my job is to help this student realize that what he regrets is that his children might be at risk. He doesn't regret that he had his children. So we have to learn how to be very sophisticated in hearing the meta message behind what people are saying. He didn't mean literally he w didn't wish he had his children, but he certainly didn't wish that he was in the situation that he had found himself in. And that was, even that was kind of hard for the student to hear because the student felt so much responsibility for the fact that this guy was sobbing and looking to him for comfort and he didn't know how to comfort him. So this is part of the training is to deal with really difficult human emotions and difficult situations and help him figure out if it was the best thing for him to go forward with testing. Helen, how would you answer that question of what sort of person makes a good counselor? Mm -hmm. um, I would say the ability to, the ability to recognize in somebody else different ways of receiving news. And I think, um, I'd say, in reading my mail over the years, I found that the people who become most frustrated by others are the ones who see everything through their own framework. Um, they, they understand, they look at a world, the world a certain way and just, without even questioning it, just assume others do the same. And I think that's the person who won't make a good genetic counselor. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the one who can just step out of their own experience and, and be able to see that, that every individual is going to have an individualized response to it. And they've got to basically watch and you know, take in the way the person is processing and then be what that person needs. Really, it's almost the same thing that to make a really good parent, actually. You know, you've got to be the parent that your kids need, not the one that you think is going to be the best parent, right? So it, for the genetic counselor, I would imagine with these incredibly difficult situations, you've got to get over yourself enough to recognize what your, your patient, your client needs. Um, Will you do interviews for us? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great description. So this is sort of the same question, but for you, David, you say that the field of medical genetics is changing rapidly. What advice would you have for someone just beginning their medical training, training to work in a job that doesn't really exist yet? Well, uh, I think that, um, I mean, I, I think the intersection of medicine and genetics is where it's happening right now. And so um, if that is the kind of area that is of interest to you, then I would, uh, get involved in it and go at it with a vengeance and uh, learn as much as you can and uh, on the one hand um, be as good a doctor as you can be and on the other hand understand this and use it to uh, give the, you know the most optimal care you can to your and, and informed care you can to your the people for whom you're responsible yeah. On a side note, it seems like as almost any job becomes more specialized, ironically, it means getting back to basics in terms of training, right? I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're blogging or vlogging or whatever, you actually need to be a decent writer. So it doesn't matter if the genetic information is changing, you need to be a good clinician and diagnostician and you know, the original skills. Right, but the originals, I, I agree with that, but the original skills, which is really, um uh, getting, uh, accumulating the information and accumulating it in a rigorous and thoughtful way. It's just that now the information, the quality of the information is 
actually much better. That's not to say that the old information, you still want that information, but there's new opportunity for really high quality information. And you want to get that information and make the best of it. Um, so um, th there will be nothing, I think, uh, in fact, the contrary, that will rep replace, I hope nothing, that will ever replace a thoughtful and caring physician. It's just that a th to be a thoughtful and caring physician, you're going to need this knowledge uh, and bring it to bear on, on your patient's conditions. When choosing a sperm or ova donor, how much screening is required as we move into the stage? You should only pick one. Choosing to have children. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how much screening is required as we move into this age of people choosing to have children on their own? This sort of gets back to what you mentioned earlier, Carolyn, about in your interest of avoiding your own genetics, you might end up with something entirely different. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much genetic information is available for donors. So it depends on the center. Some of the centers do a lot of screening for common mutations and that information is available. Some of them take extensive medical histories and family histories on the donors. Some of them do very little. Um, so it's widely variable what information that you can get. And it is one of the reasons that sometimes people go after identifying their own donors because they're people they can sit down and talk to about their family history and their medical history and get that information? I, I know at our place we do a much better job than we used to, I think. And in my earlier days, I had a child with PKU at our place. And um, as we did the family history and so forth, it turned out that there was a sperm donor and it, the, that had been set up at our, our clinic. And what I discovered was, this is, many, this is decades ago, but what I discovered was that there was a woman that was sat at the desk, and uh, if you came in the office, you would say she was a secretary. And she had a shoebox below her desk of index cards, and she would look at the couple when they came in, and then she'd go down at her index cards and say, this is a good one for you. <laughs> <laughs> and the... Um, the, the donor, in this case, was someone who had uh, <coughs> donated quite frequently and uh, so, uh, and clearly was a carrier for uh, PKU. So, I mean, there's no way to know that ahead of time. The, mis the mistake, if there was a mistake, was to let, you know, to pick someone as the donor over and over again. I have a great mental image of that woman. These people are 57. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hold on, I got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I have the sample for you? I, I, I emphasize that was many, many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, since, for the most part, the cost of genome sequencing is no longer an issue, or at least less of an issue, and the evidence is already there that the benefit is immense and growing, what are the roadblocks preventing universal genome sequencing? <laughs> I mean, isn't the obstacle that some people don't want to know? And is that a roadblock that we need to deal with? I mean, I think that's a, that's a roadblock you leave in place. Um, again, unless, unless preventive measures and treatments become so good that you can actually act on the information. But even then, I still don't think you can make it routine unless somebody s checks the box and says yes. I think also, despite the promise um, one thing that was illuminating for me is my husband and I um, a year ago visited the Sanger Sequencing Center um, in the UK, and they had done this fabulous thing. So essentially everybody on this campus literally is working on sequencing in one shape or form. Um, but there's a small little sort of education um, public policy center, and they decided that it would be a really incredible um, experience if they offered sequencing to everybody who worked there and they could go through the experience of having their genome sequenced. It was their choice, it was voluntary. And then they would sit down together and talk about what it was like to get the results. And many of the people we interviewed with when we were there had par participated in this event. And their overall conclusion was that it was absolutely the most boring information they'd ever gotten <laughs> in their entire lives. Um, and that's because you know, the amount of likelihood for any one individual to find out single gene mutations now, at least the way it had been done for them, um, that are useful to them is small. 
um, for those people in which we find them, it's, it can be very valuable information. Um, and so it's very hard to figure out when is the right time and when, you know, are, are we really close to when it could be beneficial for people or are we still at a stage where we're mostly going to get pretty boring information back. Um, and um, I don't think any of us has a really good crystal ball for that. Yeah, I, do, I don't know when the time will be right, yeah. but I do believe that we will see more and more of that. And I think we have a lot left to learn. If we, if we could understand the consequences of the sequence at every position in the genome right now, uh, we'd be doing it. Uh, we have a lot left to learn, uh, and, uh, um, but progress is moving uh, at a reasonably rapid pace, and it's progress in many different areas. It's not just the genome sequencing, it's hardcore biology, uh, uh, experimental biology of how to test and understand that information. It's how to keep track of this information, uh, how to go back and uh, re-interrogate the information because you think about it, you do, let's say you sequence someone's genome and you interpret it to the max today, I can guarantee you that if you went back and reinterpreted it a year from now, there'd be stuff that you'd learn in the interim and, and you would reinterpret it in a slightly uh, more nuanced and more informed way. And that's not the sort of standard way we do medical testing right now. We do a one-time kind of test and that's it. So. Um, I think, I th to me, I think that's the way we're going. It's just a question of how quickly we get there. The other thing I would mention is that um, we're talking about doing genome sequencing to inform the health of the individual whose genome it is. There's also um, an activity that we really haven't mentioned yet, but what would be called, what I might be call a preconceptual uh, genome testing, let's say, if not whole, sequ whole genome sequencing, but preconceptual testing for carrier status for recessive, very serious, difficult to treat recessive disorders that have their onset in childhood and we can't do a good job at treating them. And the way we discover couples that are at risk for those difficult disorders is by them having a child with that difficult mm -hmm. disorder. Now, if we could, um, and uh, this is really, I think, much uh, more in the future, I mean, in the, in the present, we could say just make a list and there are um, uh, groups that are already advocating this, make a list of a number of disease genes that are very well worked out and the, uh, you get these diseases when your parents are asymptomatic carriers and they pass it on and you have a one in four risk for each pregnancy. If we tested those parents preconceptually uh, and said N we don't actually then require that they have a child with this disorder to know that they're at risk, we say actually from the basis of the sequencing, you're at risk for having, your risk for having a child with this disorder is one in four. Mm -hmm. And that information uh, I would think would have a substantial reduction, would lead to a substantial reduction in those very thorny, difficult to treat disorders. This is essentially expanding the taste the screening program to a larger number of difficult to treat disorders. Um, we're running out of time, but I want to run through a couple of these. Do you think that PGD, which someone needs to explain that acronym, pre-gestational diagnosis? Or? Prenatal genetic di diagnosis. Um, approaches an ethically sensitive line that encroaches on eugenics. How do we protect ourselves from assuming we know good and bad genes, for example, sickle trait protection from malaria? I would say that that kind of harkens back to Caroline's example earlier where if people are affected or have had affected family members, there are sort of impressions of what the condition, the burden of the condition was. Usually PGD is used in families where the parent is affected, one of the parents is affected, doesn't want to pass on that condition to a child but wants to have a biological child. Um, and the thing I always I think PGD has offered options to families who didn't feel that they otherwise had options to have biological children, and so it can be seen as something that's been very important in people's lives, but I always like to balance it with the fact that it is very expensive and it isn't always covered 
by insurance, and so it is one of the areas where if you don't have money, it is not available to you. And I've had patients say very loudly to me, don't tell me that's a choice, because for me it is absolutely not a choice. And I think we need to always be keeping in mind when we herald up these new, um, these new options that they're available for some people, and PGD can be a, an incredible um, I've known people in Marfan families where the parents are affected and they have biological children and they're selected not to have the gene for Marfan syndrome. So, and there's many, many, many other examples um, where they feel very happy to have biological children who were not affected. Um, discuss the role of epigenetics in regards to various cancers. Let's talk about That's epigenetics yours. generally. David? <laughs> In, in five words or less? Yeah. <laughs> Tick tock. No, 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 not me. <laughs> um, um, well, uh, epigenetics is that um, um, phenomenon where the expression of genes is regulated by modifications of the, largely by modifications of the proteins coding the genes or modifications um, of the DNA that don't change the actual sequence. And uh, so just the way I like to think about it is that um, we all start life as a single cell. And that single cell then must, as the embryo develops, must create a whole battery of cells, some of which will be driven down the pathway of, let's say, being heart muscle cells, and some will be neurons, and some will be blood cells. They all have the same genetic information, and yet once they've committed to being a heart cell, when they divide, they make two heart cells. They don't make a heart cell and a neuron. Or when neurons divide, they make neurons. So these are like uh, modifications that are acquired as the individual develops that uh, turn on certain sets of genes that make certain cells do certain things and uh, turn off other sets of genes. Um, so it's a, a solution that uh, evolution has come up with for starting life as a single cell and ending up as a very complex, multicellular, multi-tissue uh, organism. Now, um, like every other biological process, epigenetics and the mechanisms by which those modifications are put in place can sometimes go awry, and when they go awry, they usually lead to abnormalities of gene regulation. And one area that, that, that we see medical consequences of that is in cancer. I think epigenetics has sort of been translated into the popular imagination as acquired traits that can then be passed on through your genetic material. Right, so uh, the vast, vast, so the vast, vast majority of epigenetic modifications are not passed on to the next generation. Again, think back to the, my example. If, if that happened, you, you couldn't really, biology couldn't start with a single cell. You have to have that plasticity to make cells of many different kinds. Um, so if you think about it, the way to do that is to erase all the epigenetics and then put it back again as the embryo develops. Now, it's a, an area of very intense interest right now because there are certain phenomenon that suggest that sometimes the, what, what we call loosely the erasure of the epigenome and reestablishment of the epigenome may not uh, occur 100% completely. And some of the data that support that are these observations that have been in the epidemiology um, field for a long time that if you look at uh, you can see transgenerational effects of, let's say, things like famines. Uh, so uh, p a group of people live through a famine. They then, two or three years later, so it's not that the embryo experienced the famine, that just these people experienced the famine. Then they have children, and then you look at the health outcomes of those children, and you can see that there are certain conditions that, are more, that occur more frequently in such children, so it's hard to explain, uh, and we know it's not in the sequence per se, so uh, then the question is, is the epi are the epigenetic marks or the epigenome completely erased, or are there some 
parts of it that are not completely erased, and that explains these phenomena. And I would say uh, that increasingly, just in the last couple of years, I've been a person saying there's no evidence for that, or no convincing evidence for that, but I must admit now, I think there is some data that really looks pretty solid for that to me. I don't know what others say, but uh, that's what I think. Um, I think we just have time for one final question here, and I'd like to hear from all of you on it, because um, I think you'll all have different takes. The question is, what are some tips regarding coping with uncertainty? <laughs> Barbara, let's start with you. So I love this question. One of my current research fascinations is perceptions of uncertainty. Um, we know a little bit from social science that our personalities have a lot to do with how we perceive and manage uncertainty. There are people who are actually ambiguity averse, um, so they they sort of stay away That's from a way to put it. <laughs> they stay away from um, things that have a, a lot of uncertainty. We also know that being an optimist uh, allows us to have greater tolerance for for uncertainty because we're more optimistic that the good will come of it on the other end. Um, and so it's a genetic counselor's job to um, get at sort of how people manage and think about uncertainty. And this has always been part of genetics from the very beginning. Um, we've often not been able to make a diagnosis or not been able to tell a family what the prognosis would be for their child, or even sometimes whether something's inherited in their family and, and what the chances are it could happen again. But it has never been more um, prevalent as it is today and certainly in genome sequencing. So even when genome sequencing is done with very good indication for rare disease and can come up um, with a mutation that probably um, explains the condition in a child, it still has a lot of uncertain information that goes along with it. And if there is another variant that's found that might be unrelated, there is often uncertainty with that. So we have to help prepare people for things that aren't necessarily related to why the test is done in the first place. And our ability to interpret that information is wrought with uncertainty. So the genetic counselors have to do a much better job at helping people really think through surprising information and information that um, may not come with a, a very full um, explanation. And so there's no magic answer to that, but I do think it's a responsibility of the providers to help people sort through um, how they manage uncertainty in their lives in general. One of my graduate students sort of said it clearly, all of life is uncertain. So we, we have to come up with our own models of how we manage that uncertainty. Um, but there are clearly some people for whom that really, they really want to avoid uncertainty. And in yep. those cases, it may be a good idea not to get themselves in a situation where there's a lot of it. So getting back to the who makes a good genetic counselor question, the ambiguity averse, maybe not yes, so much. not so much. So I, I, I think, um, uh, that uh, obviously to be alive is to deal with uncertainty because we all have uncertainties and uh, different people um, respond to it in different ways. Um, the, one, the one thing that I usually say to patients where, 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 the, where the uncertainty and the ambiguity comes down to some kind of medical issue is that um, it, I think it's very helpful to let them know before whatever you're doing, and it may be a whole genome sequence or it may be a simple blood test, that, you know, some of the, informa some, the information may come back and I may be able to give you a very clear interpretation of the significance of this information. Or it may come back and, and I won't be able to tell you with any certainty what it means. Uh, that's, that's something to be aware of before we do the test. But when, when, there, when you accumulate the information and um, there is some degree of uncertainty in terms of its significance in a health matter, what I like to say to the family is, well, let's do what we can to deal with the, um, to, to eliminate as much of the uncertainty as possible. And then we will, in the end, get down to some nidus of sort of uncertainty that we can't reduce anymore, but at least Let's ask ourselves, is there anything we could do to eliminate at least parts of it? And that may be additional testing, it may be um, tailored childhood education or hearing test, or it could be any number of things. But rather than, you know, if, if it's something that we can actually do something about, let's get that taken care of and then we'll deal with the fundamental core of uncertainty. Carolyn, dealing with uncertainty? 
Yeah, you both sort of stole my answers, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's. But it, it, I, going back to your graduate student, the all life is uncertain. You know, it's just I think that really, it's a it's a three part process, and I think the first one because I tend to be meaner is that you just have to poke through the idea that we are in control of anything, and I, I just. You just, I, I have, as I get old and cranky, I lose patience with people who think that they have a say in what happens, I mean, in what comes. I mean, certainly you can stockpile water in case your water goes out, you know, or something, but, but I think it's, uh, you know, the, what was it, the uncertainty averse, what was it? Ambiguity, ambiguity averse. averse, yes, I mean, I, I call it controlling, and, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> And stop it, um, because, and again, first is to, to tear down the illusion that you have say in many things. You get to choose what you have for breakfast, maybe, but beyond that, it's it's touch and go. And then, um, <laughs> but then I think you also have to bring in, of course, once you've reduced all that to rubble, then you bring in the optimism and you say, okay, now look at your history and look at the number of times that uncertainty, like your inability to control the outcome or your inability to foresee the outcome actually resulted in something great that you never could have expected and that you never would have driven toward on your own. And I think when you start to understand that, I mean, maybe I just live a particularly random and accidental life and that's entirely possible, but when I do that exercise and I look back at all the things that I hold most dear, almost all of them were the byproduct of something going horribly wrong somewhere else. And, and at the time, of course, during that horrible wrong, it seems like nothing good can, will ever happen again. But often, again, you find, you find some of the best things. When you get knocked off the road, you find a beautiful path. And so I think that's, you know, that's part two. And because I've gone on too long on part two, I don't remember part three. Um, <laughs> so, but it's also, I think, um, that's right, now I'm where you stole this part of the answer. The small steps, the things you can control, because you can often do productive things and you can do calming things, and I think usually the two of them are, are combined. And if you can come up with a process that you can do, and it, this could be anything, this could be medical, this could be preventive medicine, this could be figuring out treatment options, this could have nothing to do with medicine, and it could just simply be, okay, you know what, I'm gonna go back to a a pencil and paper balancing my checkbook because then I don't lose sleep over money. I mean, it can be, it can be as, as minor and as weird or as in, to anybody else completely ineffectual, but if it calms you and if it feels like you're getting somewhere, that is an, I, I find that actually is the most productive way to deal with uncertainty. It's like, because I've got my little, I can control this, you know, that what I have for breakfast. And so I am going to, you know, I'm gonna work the hell out of it. I'm gonna do it great. I'm gonna rock breakfast. You know what I mean? And, and so that, that becomes, as, as I said, sort of three parts. Of, in, in a way, it's all, of course, going back to the first one and going back to my innate cruelty, it's really delusional. Basically, you're constructing a delusion of, of optimism and control, but I'm fine with it. <laughs> can, can I and just on add one yeah. thing to that? Um, it, was a, it was a great three-part summary. Um, one of your parts, I think, was an important thing that I failed to highlight earlier, which is in most of the families that we deal with, even when we see great sadness and suffering, and we certainly see a lot of families who have um, loss that we wish we could take away for them, um, people are incredibly resilient. And what we see more often is hope, and um, even in very serious diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we've just finished a study that shows that parents who are enrolling their children in early phase trials can differentiate their expectation um, that their child is likely not to get better. These are early phase trials. They're just really safety trials, and they, honor, they understand that, but they still hope that their child will benefit, and they can distinguish those two things and they sort of say, we understand this, leave us alone because we need our hope. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we don't understand what a trial is about. We've consented to it, we, we've signed on. But uncertainty often breeds unexpected wonderful things. And the families we deal with tell us that 
over and over again, this has been the hardest thing I was ever dealt. I wouldn't change anything for it, and I'm a different person as a result of it. And they mean it very sincerely. And I think we do need to remind all of us of that. And you did that. Thank you. <laughs> that is a wonderful place to end. Barbara Biesecker, David Valley, and Carolyn Hacks, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all for your excellent, excellent questions. Um, to close the program, I'd like to invite Maria Friar, the president of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, to join us on the stage. Well, my goodness. I don't know about you, but it, it made me think a lot. And, and ending with hope, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I think we all, a round of applause for Rebecca, who did a fabulous job. <laughs> Of course, to all our presenters, Carolyn and David and Barbara, thank you. A lot of good thinking, and uh, I still want that world 20 years from now when we can tackle all of these diseases. I think it's going to be pretty awesome. And frankly, we've had an awesome audience, and the questions have been truly remarkable and thought-provoking. And thank you all for, for being here. Thank you all. This has been a wonderful end of what is still a continued journey to have. This exhibit, as you all know, will go to different cities around the country. And we are proud and pleased to continue this partnership with the museum, the National Human Genome uh, Research Institute, the Foundation for NIH, and all of our sponsors and our funders. So thank you all very much. And we continue, this is a continuing exhibit, we continue to raise funds to make sure that we have education and pro <laughs> public programming around um, these different places of the exhibit. So thank you very much. Good night. Safe home. Thank you.